good morning, everybody. I am so glad to be here with you. Um, my name is Beth, and um, uh, I love being here with you every Sunday. And so I hope that you love being here with me um, and with each other. And uh, this morning, we are going to continue our series that we started last week. It's called Imagining the Kingdom. And in this series, we have basically kind of talked about the kingdom of God. Um, If that's an unfamiliar phrase to you, the kingdom of God is really kind of the reign of God here on earth. When at the very, very beginning... um, well, well, let me start off by saying this. If, if, if that's a weird concept to talk about the kingdom of God and, and what is the kingdom of God and that's confusing to you, the easiest way I can describe it is it's really the way that things should be. And when we look in the news, we see all sorts of things and we say that's not the way that it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be that the kids go to school in fear. It's not supposed to be that families are torn apart. It's not supposed to be that there is injustice that happens. It's not supposed to be that racism exists. There's not supposed to be poverty and kids who can't eat, right? Like all of these things, it's not supposed to be that way. And God's reign is the way things are supposed to be the way things are supposed to happen. And at the very beginning of creation, God actually created heaven and earth, and he said, this is going to be my reign. This, you're going to experience who I am and the fullness of who I am through this. I mean, he sets up his kingdom on earth. And it's in the Garden of Eden, he creates animals and he creates people, and they're living there in greatness. But then, and there's even this word, this ancient word that is used to describe all of the right ways things are, and it's called shalom. This this word means peace and right order, right relationship between us and God, creation and God, man and man, right order, right relationship, shalom. But then sin enters the world, and it's all kind of fractured and broken, and the reign of God is like postponed as sin and death enter the picture. But God didn't leave it that way because he loved us so much. He said, no, 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 I want you to experience my reign. And so he found a way, he he sent his son in order to inaugurate the kingdom here on earth again. He sent Jesus and Jesus was the king and he brought this kingdom to earth. And anytime you see God working in your life or around you, you can say that's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God breaking in into the places where we work and play and live. And Jesus doesn't leave it there by just starting this kingdom up and running again. He also turns to his followers and he invites us to experience the kingdom in all of its fullness. And then he says, now I want you to work to help create this experience for other people so that others can also experience the kingdom of God. I want you to work to bring heaven to earth so that all people can experience the love and the peace and the right relationship that the kingdom of God brings. And so last week we really looked at celebrating the ways that God has brought his kingdom in this past year. I shared some of my stories of, of what we've seen in the church, and you even shared some of your stories of, of what, how you've seen God break into your worlds and start to set up his kingdom in your worlds and in your lives. And it was really cool because even when time was up, you guys kept talking, right? There were so many stories to share. Now, the really cool thing about celebrating all of the ways that the kingdom has come from heaven to earth is is it gives us a choice. One choice is to say, that is awesome. The kingdom has come, and that is enough of God's kingdom. I'm good. We experienced it. We're done. But God turns to us and he says, no, 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 I have so much more to give you. I have so much more that I want you to experience. I have the fullness of this kingdom that I want to lavish upon you. And so we talked about this analogy of a hermit crab, of how hermit crabs have to leave the warm, comfy shell that they have found for themselves when they start to outgrow it. And they have to find a new shell that's just a little bit bigger, just a little bit bigger. And it may feel uncomfortable. And so when God calls us to fuller understandings of the kingdom of God, sometimes it leads to a lot of discomfort. Sometimes it leads to kind of uh, uncertainty and insecurity and not really sure what that means or how do we interact with this greater and bigger kingdom. But it means life. 
It means that God's kingdom comes in even more fullness. It means great things for the people of God. And so he's calling us to understand this bigger picture of God's kingdom. And so what we did at the end of our service last week was we sort of imagined, like, what would it look like in a year from now to, for God's kingdom to come in even greater fullness? And actually, that's what these post-it notes around um, the room are. They're ways that we are imagining the kingdom to come in our homes and in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces and in our city and in, our, um, and in the world And we just sort of jotted down some of these dreams of how we hope and expect and imagine that God's kingdom will come in even greater fullness. Now, what we're going to talk about today is now that we've kind of imagined some of these ways that we hope for and expect God's kingdom to come, we're going to kind of turn the corner. We're going to talk a little bit about how. Like, how does the imagination of the kingdom the imagination and the dream of the kingdom actually become a full and present reality of the kingdom. How does it go from, I've just imagined it, to, no, 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 it's here. I'm experiencing it. It's coming in its fullness. Now, we often imagine that the way that that's going to happen is, is people will come to church. They're going to come to our church because for every single one of us, we've actually experienced pieces and learned about the kingdom of God at a place like this. And so we think, well, I experienced the kingdom here, and so other people need to come here in order to experience the kingdom. And that actually makes a lot of sense. It actually is pretty effective for people who look like you and who speak the same language as you and who have some familiarity with what church is. They grew up kind of going to church, or at least Christmas and Easter, they kind of went to church. So there's some sort of understanding of what that means. They probably look like the people in this room. And so for them, they may be willing to come to a place like this and experience church and experience the kingdom of God through a place like this. However, there are a lot of people that don't fit into that category. There's a lot of people in this world that don't come from the same background as you, don't have the same experiences or expectations. They don't look anything like you. They don't speak your language. Uh, They have no idea what happens in a building like this. It is creeps and spooky and weird. And so for a second, I just want you to put yourself in the shoes of that person. And maybe you have actually experienced something like what I'm going to share with you now. Maybe you actually are like, no, 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 that... I, I told, that's me. I totally get that, right? So put yourselves in the shoes of someone who you just had a neighbor move in next to you. Maybe this is, really is you. You just had a neighbor move in next to you, and they're being super friendly to you, like really, really nice. They wave when they drive into their driveway, and when you're out cutting the grass, they don't just go inside. They come over, and they're like, hey, how you doing? Yeah, that grass got long, all that rain, right? Chit-chat, chit-chat, chit-chat. And then um, you, your kids start playing in the front yard together, and that's sort of fun, and you're glad that they have a playmate, and That's great. Uh, So you are sort of exchange names. You kind of know. And you learn about this family that they're from India and they're Hindu. And actually, you even learn that they are, had an arranged marriage. And you're like, that's strange. I've never encountered that before. Okay. So that's kind of what you're learning. And then all of a sudden, that family, they say, hey, I really want you to come to Hindu temple with me. Will you come to Hindu temple? We have this really great celebration that is coming up. It's um, Krishna's Jaymashmi. And it's the celebration of our Lord Krishna's birth. And so, like, we want you to come and experience it. It's going to be super fun. There's this person who does the teaching, the pundit. And, oh, my gosh, he's so funny. He tells the best stories. You won't get bored at all. You'll, like, love this thing. It'll be great. And then there's, we do music. And the music's super entertaining and really, really good. Great singer. Like, great singer. You're going to love it. And we all sing along together. And then, oh, there's a kids program. And so, like, we stay together for a little bit. But then the kids go off into another room. And they play games. We teach them about God about what it means to worship God. Um, And don't worry, all the adults are background checked. So, like, it's okay, the kids are safe. And then you you pick them up afterwards. And then we do a meal together, and we just hang out. Now, everything's going to be in Hindi, but uh, don't worry. Like, I'll translate for you. It'll be fine. It'll be great. Now, after an invitation like that, how would you respond? Would you say, yes, I want to go to Hindu temple with you? Or would you say, 
I, I don't even know. You've explained what happens, but no. <laughs> I have no idea. What it, there are so many cultural barriers that exist between you and attending Hindu temple, right? There's a language barrier. There's an ethnic barrier. There's a national barrier. There's all sorts of different things that would make it a very big challenge for you to say, yes, I want to go do that. Now, turn the example for a second. There are people in our midst, in our world, but I don't mean world globally. I mean world like your neighbor or the person you work with, that in order to come to church to experience the kingdom of God would require them to overcome some significant cultural barriers, some significant unknowns. And for them, that makes it really, really hard for them to step foot into this building. There's actually this guy, his name's Alan Hirsch, and he wrote this book called The Forgotten Ways. Um, and he talks about this. He, he lays out this diagram that I thought was super helpful, so I wanted to share it with you. He says, here's church. Look, steeple. Here's the door. There's people inside. If you open the door, they walk away. Good. Okay. So, he talks about how there's church, <clears throat> and in our culture, there are these different cultural barriers that exist. And the more cultural barriers that there are, the further and further people are to stepping into a church, the further they are into moving in this direction, the harder it becomes, okay? So here's the idea. Each one of these numbers, M1, M, M0, M1, M2, M3, M4, each one of those represents like a significant cultural barrier that stands in the way between them traveling to where they are, where their cultural norms are, and coming to a place like this. So like M0 to M1, that is actually people who have a very, like, they understand, they have some familiarity with church and Christianity. Um, they speak sort of the same language. They probably speak English. Although I think it's ironic because in our church, like, we have people in our church that don't speak English. So, like, way to go. Good job, everybody. Um, but most churches, like, are one language. Um, so these are people that all speak the same language as the church. They have similar interests. They're a similar education level. They're a similar class. They're similar nationality, ethnicity. Um, again, we have varied ethnicities and nationalities in our church, which, again, good job. We're great. Um, but, but typically, this is all, like, the same sort of people. And they all kind of already have a very strong familiarity with church. They would be real likely to come to church. But as you move to this group right here, this M1 and M2 group, this is a group that we would include sort of our typical thing that we think of when we think of a non-Christian. Um, they're a person who has very little awareness or interest of Christianity that's just never been a part of their rhythm or routine. Like, it's just not really happened. Um, they're a little bit suspicious of Christianity. They've probably had some sort of bad experience. Um, they have some story of how they were wounded in the church or somebody in the church hurt them or they went one time and it creeped them out. So they were like, I'm out. I'm not interested in doing this. This is a pretty typical experience for somebody who's like not engaged with the church, but they're not real far from engaging with the church. Meanwhile, this group here, this M2, M3 group is one more removed um, they are a group of people who have absolutely no idea what Christianity is all about. They've kind of heard some things in the media. They've heard some people who, um, who uh, are, are uh, it's not popular, famous in the media that sort of tout some sort of Christian beliefs and they think that must be what Christianity is. It's typically um, a fringy subculture group or an ethnic group with other religious implications or it's a group that has been marginalized by Christianity. So this would be like the LBGTQ uh, community or another community that like typically have, the church has said some nasty things about, right? Or <clears throat> in the M3 to M4 category, this is even more removed. This is somebody who actually has been inhibited by some sort of historical um, or ethnic or religious grouping that's had a bad history with the church. For example, Muslims or Jews. Um, they might be a little bit closer if they live in the West, 
It reduces some of the distance, but there's a lot of things that get in the way of meaningful dialogue in which this person would actually choose, somebody in this category would actually choose and say, yes, I woke up Sunday and I said, let's go to church. Right? Do you kind of get how this is? There are people that are pretty close, and then there are people that are much, much further away to having a meaningful experience with the gospel. They're highly resistant. And so if we have in our brains that the only way people to, uh, can experience the kingdom of God is by coming to this place, these people are real good. But we got some real issues when it comes to the people who fall in these other sort of cultural categories. There's sort of an issue with that. So what do we do? How do we help people in these further categories experience the gospel? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to fix our thinking. Because a lot of times we think, oh, they have to come to us. But the truth is that God actually sent us to them. We keep thinking that the arrows need to go this way. But actually what God is trying to tell us through all of scripture, all of history, is that we actually are supposed to go to them. I don't know if I drew too many arrows or not. We are supposed to go to them. Now, you don't have to look far in order to see this. Because actually, if you just think about the attributes of God, right, some of the attributes we come up with really quickly are like love, forgiveness, compassion, and mercy. We think of justice. But here's another one that a lot of times we kind of let go of partially because we don't really like this idea. Another attribute of God is that he's the sent one. He's a missional God. There's actually this Latin phrase, it's um, missio dei. And a lot of scholars translate that as the mission of God. But there are other scholars that say, no, 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 it's not the mission of God. To say it's the mission of God is actually to say it's something God does. It's not what he does. It's who he is. And so they would translate it as missionary God or the sent God. That he is always in the business of jumping over barriers and obstacles in order to go after the people that he loves. God propels himself outward into the lives of others. If you look at the first page of, of scripture all the way through the whole thing, you will see evidence of this. Right At creation, God sends forth his word and he changes chaos into order. He creates man and he sends forth his breath to have them experience life. Even after they are exiled from the garden, he goes after them. He pursues them. He sends Abraham. He sends Moses. And when they're trapped up against the Red Sea, he sends rescue. When they're wandering in the wilderness, he sends rescue again. He guides his people by a cloud and by fire. He is always intervening in the lives of his people. He goes after his people no matter how many times they disappoint him, no matter how many times they betray him, no matter how many times he continues to meet them where they are at. Even in the exile, right, this time where God had set up this promised land, he had set up this um, earthly kingdom to be like, okay, you guys are going to live, this is, you're going to be my people, I'm going to be your God, and then they mess it up, they betray him, and they are exiled from that land. Even then, they're dragged off to Babylon, which is like this God-forsaken place. And what the Israelites realize is that God has gone after them, that God has shown up in Babylon, that he is there, he is present. Actually, there's this Jewish scholar who wrote this commentary on, on the, the, the Jewish scriptures, which is our Old Testament, and he actually called it God in search of man. He says, the whole Old Testament is a story of God constantly going after his people and going after no matter where they are. Now think for a second, what if God had only sent himself was only willing to chase after people that were very similar to him. He only wanted to go after the eternal ones. 
He only after wanted to go after the ones who had a similar background and uh, experience and expectations of forgiveness and unconditional love. He only wanted to pursue those who looked like him. We'd all be sunk. We'd all be sunk. Instead, what God does is he crosses every barrier. He crosses language, he crosses space, he crosses dimension, he crosses culture, he crosses species, if you could say, like, God is a different species than man, which, don't quote me on that scientifically, I think that's really wrong. In fact, theologically, it's wrong. But he crosses every barrier in order to be with us. In fact, in John 3, 16, right, this is this verse that, that we know so well. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave or he sent his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have life, would have an experience of the kingdom. And so Jesus comes to earth, and after he lives this life and this ministry that says, hey, this is what the kingdom of God looks like, he dies he comes back to life, and then he returns to his father, and he sends another thing. The father and the son send the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus had promised. In John 16, 7, it says this. It says that very, Jesus said this, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away, because unless I go away, your advocate, who is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. It I go, but I, but it I go, but I will go, but if I go, but if I go, I will send him to you. And this is what the Holy Spirit's job is. Jesus tells us, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. This Holy Spirit is sent so that we can experience the kingdom. And then we can bring the kingdom to earth so that others can experience it too, right? Us, our own experience of the kingdom isn't the end. We are then sent. And so in John 20, 21, this is what Jesus says. He says, as the Father has sent me, I have sent other people to you. Nope, that's not what it says. It says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I am sending you into these places. I am sending you out over every cultural barrier, over every comfort zone, over every language or political affiliation, over every nationality and perspective and race and religion, over every life uh, choice, over every sexuality. God has sent us out. He covered the distance for us, and now he sent us out to cover the distance. He's saying, go to these places. Bring the kingdom. Now, your response to some of this may be uneasy and uncertain, and you're like, no, 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 I like my version of the kingdom, right? We all like our version of the kingdom. We all like our version of the kingdom that exists here, but God is sending us out he has such a bigger understanding of what the kingdom looks like than we could ever imagine. And he's trying to help us understand what this looks like. Now, you may be thinking like, but I don't know people in that category. I don't know people from there. So, like, I know these people so I can, like, meet them, have them over for dinner, and, like, experience the kingdom. That's fine. But I don't know those people. I don't know people from those categories. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that was probably how the disciples felt when Jesus sent them out, right? There's this story of Jesus sending out the 72 to the villages that are coming up. And I'm sure that the disciples were like, but I don't know anybody in those villages or towns. What if they're different than me? What if I can't connect with them? What if, like, we don't have the same political affiliations? What if we don't, like, speak the same language? I'm sure that is exactly how they felt. I don't know them. I don't know how to do it. But Jesus gives them these instructions. Jesus tells his disciples. He says that when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on them. And if not, 
it will be returned to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a house and are welcomed, eat what they offer you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them that the kingdom of God has come near. Now, I want to talk about that for a second. Now, first of all, I have a really hard time with the eat what is offered to you. I um, so I've had a few experiences with refugees. One of them um, was a Syrian refugee and visited her several times in her house. And every time I went, she made Turkish coffee. And this was this thing that was really, really important for me to drink. I do not drink black coffee. It is the strongest shot of black coffee you will ever. And I'm like, sugar, milk, like anything. No, 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 no. Turkish coffee, like drink it. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Like, and then she sees me drink it really fast, and she's like, do you, another, another, another. And I'm like, oh, no, this is so gracious. I'm good, right? Then I had another one with actually a Korean refugee uh, recently, and she is a baker, and she makes phenomenal baked goods. And she had brought me some, and she was like, here, here, eat, eat. Okay, so you may not know this about me, but I can't eat wheat. I can't eat gluten, right? And so I'm like, oh, that's so nice. Like, just sit it right here. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm supposed to eat the thing she brings me, but it's going to make me sick for days. Like, what do I do with this, right? And through Google Translate, we worked that out, and it was fine. But brought it home to my husband and was like, eat all of these. Like, enjoy <laughs> them all, right? Um, but, but I love that Jesus' thing was like, tell them peace. Like, go into their house and just say, peace. Peace with you. The hard part is we often think we know how to proclaim peace to other groups of people. We think that it's the same way that we would proclaim peace to ourselves. Um, the hard part is it's not always. And we have to learn what that means. What words and actions, as we go through our life, what words and actions are speaking peace? Do we think are peace, speaking peace to people? And are they really? I'm reminded of a story. We have um, a partnership uh, down in Haiti with a woman named Maquette. She runs an organization called Teach Haiti, and she educates um, over 400 uh, Haitian kids every, every year. She's, she's um, building the schools. I mean, it's really incredible work that she's doing. Last year, I had the opportunity to go visit her, and she was sharing this story with me. There was um, these people on the side of the road, and they, had, they were selling rice, and the sign said, uh, I asked her what the sign said, and the sign said, not American. And I was like, why is that what the sign says? And she explains that uh, back in the earthquake, when there was an earthquake several years ago in Haiti, um, there was actually uh, this foundation that thought that it would be really helpful to sell the Haitian government American rice for really cheap prices, which like, makes you think that's great because then the people can buy the rice for really cheap prices, right? Like in American economy, that makes sense. The problem was, like, they thought that this was how to bring peace the country of Haiti. The problem began, began in that when they flooded the market with American cheap rice, all of the Haitian rice farmers who had put blood, sweat, and tears into cultivating this rice were now in a place where they couldn't sell their rice to undercut the American prices. And it put these hard working Haitians out of work. And it's not like, oh, I'm out of work, I'll go get another job. There are no jobs. And so this foundation, though they thought that this was peace, was not peace. And so sometimes what we need to learn is we have to learn what does peace look like to these different places that we're going, to these unknown cultures, these cultures that we may not have a lot of experience in. What does it look like to say peace to you? And then Jesus says that if you find a person of peace, stay with them. Stay with them. This is what a person of peace is. It's somebody could, who can operate as a guide for you as you try to figure out how do I serve? How do I love? How do I care for these individuals? How do I become the servant of this place? How do I really work for and offer peace to these places and not assume that I know how to do it? And so they say, he says, Jesus says, find a person of peace because they can be your guide as you go forth. 
Now, I want to share with you another experience that I've had of how this has kind of worked out personally. Now, we have a date night coming up on July 7th, and uh, we would love for you to invite your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers to come participate in the date night. Basically, they drop off their kids and they get to go on a date. Um, we need everybody to volunteer in order to make this happen. It's going to be a great experience. But here's what I learned. Even though it does this, it's still a great thing. But this really hits this group of people. Someone who's coming from this experience is probably not going to participate in a date night. And I didn't realize that until I actually was talking with um, the, the best brains people, the people, who, the tutoring company that rents out downstairs. I was actually talking to the director. And I said, hey, can, can we put out some of our flyers from the last date night? Can we put out some of our flyers um, so maybe your kids could participate in this? And she said, yes, that's fine, that's fine. And she begins to talk to me. Her name's Alka, and she is an Indian woman. Um, and she works with these kids, and she is a fierce lady. I mean, she is phenomenal. And so I was talking with her, and I was like, don't you think, you know, uh, do you think, have you seen a lot of families take these flyers? And she said, no, but I don't expect that they would. And I said, why? And she said, well, in the Indian culture, there's a lot of arranged marriages. And so the idea that you as a couple would need to go out on a date is not quite, we don't really need that so much. That's not who we are. And I never had ever imagined that. I had never imagined it. And so what I realized was, guys, 32% of our community, of our city, is an Asian or Indian population. And so I realized, I don't know these people. I need to know them better. I need to understand who they are. I need to understand what's going on. I need to humble myself and be sent to them instead of assuming that I know what they need. I know that they need a date night. And so I actually started thinking, who are the people in my life that actually are from this community? Who are my neighbors? Who are my kids' parents? Who are our friends? And I thought of this one woman who actually is the, is the mother of one of my child's friends. And she's an Indian woman, and she had invited us over, and I had kind of been like, no, 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 we're good. And I realized my mistake. She had invited us in, and I didn't say yes. And so it was Mother's Day. They did a Mother's Day tea. And so I went and I strategically sat next to this person so that I could be like, hey, tell me about, tell me about you. Let's get to know each other. Let's build a bit of a relationship. Now, I didn't dig in in that second and say, okay, you have an arranged marriage. And tell me about that. And what do you need? What does your community, right? Right then, it was just building a relationship. Tell me about your kids. Tell me about your family. Where do you live? All of those sorts of things. And then I <clears throat> said to her, I said, hey, uh, this is me falling flat on my face, by the way. Uh, I said to her, I said, your family should come over and we should have a barbecue. Now, some of you are laughing because you have more cultural awareness than I do. Uh, generally, Indians, particularly those who are Hindu, do not eat meat. So the idea of a barbecue was like, so she, she didn't hide it well. It was all over her face that this was like, and I'm going for a barbecue. And so, and so, and I was like, oh, what, what's wrong? She goes, we don't eat meat. And I said, oh, I will cook mushrooms. Don't worry. I will do portobello mushrooms. We'll have mushroom burgers. And she was like, no, we don't eat mushrooms. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But very graciously, she turned to me and she said, you'll come to our house. I'll make you Indian food. You'll come to our house. And I said, yes, <laughs> that sounds great. In fact, can you teach me to cook Indian food? Because I'd love to be able to do that. Guys, this is what it looks like to humble ourselves and be sent to these spaces. And when I talk about being sent, I'm not talking about across the world. I'm talking about our neighbors. I'm talking about the people who are right next to us that we would begin to engage in all new ways, that we would humble ourselves. Now, here's my question for you. When you imagine the kingdom of God, when we did the exercise even last week, do you mostly imagine in this sphere? Do you mostly imagine the kingdom expanding in the realms of people that look like, talk like, think like, and act like you? Or are you bold enough 
to imagine the kingdom of God going far beyond any cultural barriers that may exist. If it only includes this, we've got to dream bigger. We've got to dream bigger because we have been sent. Now, as you're imagining and you begin to pick up people in all of these different categories and imagine the ways that God's kingdom is going to come into all of those spaces, I'm going to challenge you that you find someone that is in that space and you get to know them. You sit down and have a meal. You enter their house. You know them. Some of the things that are on these post-its are awesome. Like, just, like, as I was reading them this week, I actually started to cry because I was like, oh, my gosh. The imagination, the grasp of our picture of the kingdom is beautiful. And if you have imagined a group of people, I want to challenge you to go to them. Whether it be teenagers or prisoners or people with a, Muslim, with a Muslim faith, whether it be people of different nationalities or ethnicities, whether it be people with different socioeconomical status, that you would go to them. That you would find a person of peace that you would meet with them and learn from them and humble yourself and fall on your face and be like, I have no idea, I'm sent, but I have no idea what to do. Teach me. Teach me. So what we're going to do is we're going to respond to God's sentness today. And I actually want to invite you to return to the post-it notes again. That as we've had this conversation, that if maybe you weren't here last week and you want to add to them, you want to write something about the places where you imagine the kingdom coming in your home, your neighborhoods, your workplaces, your city, or the world, and you want to add something up there, for the first time, that's great. But if you also want to return for the second time and you want to say, you know what, I need to imagine something bigger than just this. I want to start imagining what does it look like to go to these spaces. I want to invite you to re-engage those post-its and write some of those places where you can begin to imagine the kingdom. Maybe there are specific people that you know that you're like, this is where I want to see the kingdom come. This is who I want to engage. This might be my person of peace. And I want you to write those names or those places up on those post-it notes. I think that it can get scary to do that. But what you have to remember is that God doesn't just exist in this building. God exists in all of these spaces. God has already sent himself forth to be in those places. And he's not saying, hey, go alone. You go ahead. I'll follow behind. He says, no, 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 I'm already here. Would you join me? Would you come and would you join me? The thing is, is that God has already crossed every barrier. He did it for you, and he calls you to do it for others. This next song that we're going to sing is a song called So Will I. And, and I just want to run through the bridge real quick so that you can understand how this really is a response to what we're talking about today. The bridge goes like this. It says, if the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. If everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still fall shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion times. In this song, there is this theme of obedience, of wherever it is that you want me to go, I will go. I will be sent. 
Even though it makes me nervous, even though it makes me uncomfortable, I will go. I thought this was a perfect way for us to respond to this call to be sent into these places. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much that you are a God who sent your son, crossed all of the barriers, crossed all of the darkness, crossed all of the sin to meet us right where we are at. And so, Father God, would you send us? Would you allow us to just rest in your grace and your mercy and your love? Would you fill us with your compassion for people who are far? Would you send us far? Would we imagine a kingdom that goes far? And Father, would you give us a spirit of obedience? Would you give us opportunity and divine appointment to meet people in those places? We pray all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Would you stand?